thinner and thinner and thinner, right? So as I, if my bladder is a balloon and my balloon is fully full of urine, as I urinate and empty the bladder, the walls get thicker and thicker and thicker. That's what happens with your tissue up here. When you're full of urine doing the pee pee dance, I gotta go, I gotta go, gotta go, and then you void, you urinate, right? The bladder begins to relax, the wall gets thicker and thicker and thicker. So I go through a transition of appearances of thickness and a transition in the shape of my cells, which is why it's called transitional. And we'll point more of that out in a bit in 242 next quarter. Here's an actual photograph of it. When you look at it, it takes a bit of practice, but if you look right here, see how this is kind of a more reddish pink right along in here? And then this is more of a, I don't know, a violet color, right? This color is different than this color. This texture is different than this texture. This looks a little bit wavy, almost like a Monet painting almost. So I can envision a basement membrane running right along with my tracing with my laser pointer here. That means all of this epithelium. Okay, good. There's my lumen then. More than one layer? Yes. Okay. That means it could be stratified squamous, cuboidal or columnar, or maybe transitional. I go to the topmost layer. That is not a columnar cell. That is not a cube. It's not a squamous. That's round. I don't have stratified round for a name. That's your hint. It's probably transitional. These are oval-shaped apical cells. And if you see oval-shaped or domed, rounded-shaped cells, you must be looking at transitional epithelium. And again, it just simply takes practice, like being that alien and learning what a chihuahua is compared to a Labrador. Once it's pointed out to you, you just practice thinking about this. What I would do is look at this and go, okay, these are rounded oval cells. I then close my eyes and I picture it. Kind of rounded oval, get used to thinking about it, and I'll help you memorize <coughs> its appearance. Here is simple columnar, right? Again, you first you find an edge, you find a lumen, right? There's my lumen. Therefore, this stuff does not look like this stuff. Therefore, this is only my layer of epithelium. There's the basement membrane. I have a single row of nuclei. They're rectangular in shape, so this is going to be simple columnar. Then an actual photograph of it. Now, simple columnar epithelium would oftentimes have on the apical aspect of the cell these little structures called microvilli, which I'm hoping you were exposed to in 211. Does anybody know what microvilli are or how they're formed? Because they're not the same as cilia. How are cilia and microvilli different? Hmm. Cilia or microtubule extensions. There's actually microtubules in the structure. Microvilli are just folds of the cell's membrane. They're still a part of the cell membrane, but they're really small, and there are no microtubules in them. But cilia are made up of microtubules in the pattern of nine pairs of two, if you remember that from 211. If not, that's okay for the moment. Why do I care about microvilli? Whenever you see epithelia with microvilli, your first thought is going to be this. I know it's simple. I know simple is good for diffusion and absorption. The fact that it has microvilli must mean it's really damn good at it. Because microvilli increases the surface area. And that's really important in physiology. The more surface area, the more opportunities for diffusion to take place. So I have more areas I could diffuse across the membrane with. So simple columnar without microvilli is not as good at diffusing as simple columnar with microvilli. So it's sort of this idea here. You're going to give me some strange looks. <clears throat> Let's do this. Take this length, all right? So that's going to be <coughs> nine, that's 10 and a half inches. So right there is literally nine inches from end to end. So that's a nine inch line, right? Okay. What if I did this? Is this line nine inches? It's a lot more, isn't it? It still occupies nine inches of length, but if I straighten it out, it's probably more like this. That's the benefit of folding the cell's membrane to make microvilli. 
Now that means things could cross anywhere along my purple line. I've got more opportunities in a smaller region. So whenever you see microvilli, your thoughts should be in terms of physiology, there's a lot of diffusing taking place here. That's why your small intestines are covered in microvilli, so you can maximize the absorption of nutrients. And then stratified columnar, okay? Notice how there are no microvilli here. So a simple columnar can add microvilli, stratified won't. And if we go to the cartoon, right, to make it simple, the rule is John says find an edge, there's one edge here, there's one edge there. Pick one, doesn't matter, right, because this is a tube. So that means this stuff is epithelium, that stuff is not, that's for next week. More than one layer? Yes. Top row, typical layer, columnar in shape, therefore it's stratified columnar. Don't count the number of layers, I don't care. Just recognize there's more than one. Now, with this, also notice how the apical layer, the nuclei, are nicely arranged. Like, you'd be very happy to have a type A personality. Like, if you're OCD, you're happy. They're nicely organized. Right? Keep that in mind. Because this is pseudostratified. Remember, pseudo means fake. Therefore, pseudostratified is fake multiple layers. It is actually a single layer of cells but they are so squished and so compact that they distort the membranes of the neighboring cells, which gives you a false impression as they squish the nucleuses up and down along their neighbors. So you think there's multiple rows of nuclei here. See how unorganized that is? I mean, I might have one, two, maybe three apparent rows here, because they're not neatly organized, right? They are neatly organized. OCD kind of happy, a total mess. I need to fix this. That's a hint to me. They're not organized very neatly. Therefore, this might be pseudostratified. Part two, go to the top edge, and what do I have on the apical side of my cells? Not mm -hmm. microvilli, but what? Cilia. Cilia. And they're a lot longer in length than microvilli are. So if I see a really disorganized mess of nucleuses, that I would want to arrange to look more organized, I'm thinking pseudostratified. And the fact that these, what appear to be maybe apical layers, are rather columnar in shape, I'm thinking pseudostratified columnar. The fact that they have micro, I'm sorry, that they have cilia, is another confirmation that this is a pseudostratified columnar. There is no such thing as pseudostratified cuboidal or squamous. There is only pseudostratified columnars. Here's the other hint. Let's go back and look at this. Look at the actual photograph and see how very little space there is between the nucleuses and the apical layer and the actual apical edge of that cell. There's very little space here between the nucleus and the top portion of those cells. But look here, there's a crap load of space. Like somebody came in and kind of shoved them all down toward the bottom. That's another hint. You're looking at pseudostratified. There's lots of space. Um, sorry, uh, did you say, so there's no pseudostratified... Uh, Cuboidal or squamous. The only pseudo you're going to have is columnar. So there's no, there's no pseudostratified cuboidal, there's no pseudostratified squamous. Now, this will just take practice. We kind of just bounce back and forth, right? Multiple layers, no cilia. The appearance of multiple layers, but it has cilia. So I don't have any tissues that are stratified columnar with cilia. I don't have that. It doesn't exist. That's another hint that if you want to call it stratified columnar, but you see cilia, there's no such thing. Therefore, you're looking at pseudostratified columnar. This is one of the more trickier problem, problematic tissues for you guys. The difference between this and that. It'll just take practice, but once you get the hang of it, it's like, dude, why did I have a problem a week ago? Now it's very obvious. It's just a new thing to look at, a new thing to memorize, a new thing to envision. But by this time next week, you should have no problem in recognizing, because we'll also point this out in the lab, hopefully we have a lab next week. 
Yeah. So those cilia are aid for digestion? Uh, no, not at all. Okay. Those cilia are good for moving things along. So your trachea and your, your fallopian tubes will have lots of cilia to move either the egg or the mucus that's in your trachea up and down. So it's more of an escalator-like effect, <coughs> but not for absorption. Okay. Now, I know that there are multiple cells in epithelia. I need to anchor my cells to their neighbors, as we mentioned earlier in tonight's lecture. How do I go about anchoring or stabilizing cells next to other cells? We're going to use these structures that are known as intercellular connections. You're going to stop right there for a moment. You're going to break the word down. I recognize the word cellular. Okay, I know what a cell is. I know what a connection is, so I'm doing good so far, but the trick is inter. What does inter refer to? Between. Means between. Very good. And what's the opposite of between? Within. Within. So you've got either intercellular, which is this word up there, right? Which means from one cell to another, between two cells, versus intra, which means within the cell. And let's put this in a common language. When you're talking to somebody else and you're working on your relationship, the counselor says, you need to work on your interpersonal communication skills. Communication from person to person. But when you meditate, right, I think within, are you, are you doing introspection or introspection? You're introspecting. You're looking within yourself. Because of intra, meaning within. Now, first let's do this. Just memorize the different types of intercellular connections. Regardless of what they are, just memorize the names first. We're going to have several different things. We're going to have tight junctions, adhesion belts, gap junctions, desmosomes, and hemidesmosomes. You just memorize the names first. Get used to the name. Now, as you do that, you're now introduced to the beginning of a frustration you're going to experience through lots of 241 and lots of 242. We have multiple names for the same damn thing. In some cases, we have four names for the same thing. You've got to learn all four names. So I can either call them tight junctions or I can call them occluding junctions. Either one is um, usable. Tight is the more common version of this. Occluding is more of an old-fashioned name, and it's getting rarer and rarer to see the word occluding. But I want you to be aware of that term in case you come across it. I don't care which one you use. I will use the word tight junction, just as an FYI. All right, so now I know there's four or five different mechanisms, things, I can use to anchor or to attach one cell to another. I can use a tight junction, an adhesion belt, a gap junction, a desmosome, or a pen. I don't know what the hell they are, but I know they exist. Okay, now, what are they? Let's look at these different diagrams that are here. Let's go to this one for um, diagram B, where I have in a blue box the word occluding junction. I mean, what the hell is that? Oh, that's right, it's a tight junction. Now, Here's where you're going to be practicing. Don't look at a picture, but look at a picture. Dissect it. Analyze it. Learn from it. And look at what you're, what you're actually seeing. I'm seeing two cell membranes next to each other, and they're being pinched together, like two sheets of, of cloth. There's this pink line, which is one cell membrane. It belongs to this cell here. And this pink line is the other cell membrane to the neighboring cell, the cell over here. There are these proteins that are like stapling portions of the membrane down its length that literally staple the two membranes <coughs> together, forming a tight connection. Hence the word tight junction. It's like someone took a sewing machine and just used biological thread to pinch the two cells together. The reason they're referred to as tight junctions is that if my red light was a molecule, then things cannot pass between those two cells. I can't go down the length of these cells 
because I'm stopped at the tight junction. It forms a tight seal. And then later in 2482, I'll tell you how I just lied. Because <laughs> there's tight tights and loose tights. Right now, I'm not going to worry about that. Okay? So that's the first one, tight junctions. Now, the next thing is tight junctions are only found in the apical portion of neighboring cells. They're not found. Look at the picture over here, right? There's the tight junctions right, by these microvilli. There are no tight junctions further on down the length of the cell. So they're only found in the upper portion of that cell. They're not found further down along the side. So they're kind of regionally specific. Now, there's another structure called a tight belt, or an adhesion belt, I should say, right? Now, think about what a belt is, right? It goes around your waist to keep your pants up or your shorts up. Well, an adhesion belt is a belt of proteins that goes along the length of the upper edge of the top part of the cell. So let's make this table a cell, right?